Thank you. Happy to be here. A uh, little bit of um, kind of trivia about SM Camp. Actually, happily, last year when we were just launching this product, uh, was kind of in a back room there. Paul had asked us to do a demo when we were, you know, brand new. And uh, quite a lot has happened for Happily in the last year. Uh, but before I go into that, let me tell you what we're all about and the problem that we solve. So we think that since the beginning of time, uh, people haven't exactly been honest with their leaders when those leaders needed to get that honest feedback. You guys agree that that's pretty much kind of a consistent problem across culture, company, organization? So the question is, how do managers understand what their people are actually thinking? So what we've designed is a system, which I'm going to demo to you, that allows for employees to answer anonymously questions that have been designed by their manager or by their leadership team to understand the specific issues that are affecting their team's performance. These are the issues that would actually, if not surfaced, would actually affect the company's performance. So there's a lot of software solutions that focus on recognizing top performers, but there's no software solution until Happily that recognizes whether your top performer is about to leave. So that's what Happily is focused on, is being able to provide that honest feedback in real time. So I'm gonna demo you first what an employee sees. Very simple, straightforward interface. Here's a set of questions which I'm being asked to answer today. Uh, always the questions have a positive, neutral, and negative answer. And as a general rule, we're asking questions in five key areas that affect your work. We're asking questions about how you feel, questions about your boss and leadership team, questions about the work that you're doing, the company overall, and then the people that you work with. So let's go ahead and answer some of these questions as if I were just sitting in, sitting in my cubicle. So I feel respected by my boss today. Let's say, you know, no. Uh, I believe the work I'm doing today is a good use of my skills. Mm, well, okay, yeah. Right now I feel content about my job. Now, let's say for example that I, I kind of know these questions are coming, but there's something that's been happening that I know a question isn't there to be, uh, that, that there's not gonna be a question that's gonna be asked of me about that. So I can suggest my own question. Should we be, I can't type, should we be working on weekends? Uh, and I'm gonna say that this is a question about work. Um, yes, sometimes, and no. So that question gets submitted, and then if my manager says, yeah, that's a good question that we should be asking, that question would then be presented in this stream of questions. So I believe the company's heading in the right direction, yes. I respect most of the people I'm working with, let's say yes. I respect my boss's leadership, let's say unsure. I feel rewarded by my work today, that's still early in the day, so let's say unsure. And I feel good about the people I work with, let's say yes. So what that does is it tells me that my current mood, according to Happily, is also somewhat unsure. And, but in just a couple of minutes, in fact even in less than a couple of minutes, I've been able to give, not only Happily, but this company, very important information about how I'm feeling about those, those areas that I just had answered questions about. Down here, what you're seeing is how my own answers in blue compare to that of my team in the yellow line. And I'm able to see that in real time in each of the areas in which we're asking questions. So, you know, for instance, one of the things that we've actually found is, is that certain employees who managers would actually describe as problem employees have actually come to their manager with their Happily dashboard and said, look, I, you know, for a while I was kind of blaming you or blaming the team or blaming the company, but I actually realized I'm just not a fit here. Everybody else is happy, I'm not. And uh, that's actually led to um, some significant uh, joy for some of our customers in that area. So um, I can also, if I don't want to answer questions or if I want to just even more quickly answer something, I can just take in a, a, a drop down emotion like say happy and I feel happy about um, our customers and I can post that and you can see that actually that changes my mood back to happy. So this is all updated in real time. So what I'm now going to show you is how a manager actually uses this information to make decisions and gain actionable insights within their team. So here I am a manager of a small team. What I'm seeing, these lines, uh, the higher the line, the better the sentiment, the better people are feeling. 
here what I'm seeing is the, the, the week's scores about work. Here's the same thing for company. Notice that there's a significant change in how these scores look. Here's the team score. Again, you know, I can look at some significant deviations and say, okay, well, people were feeling better about the company today, you know, on the fourth as an example, but it actually dropped in terms of how people were feeling about the team. So if you're a manager, you know, working closely with your team, just looking at this visual dashboard should give you a good idea of being able to detect issues in real time. But for other managers, or depending on kind of the work environment, I may need more insights than just this graph can provide. So what I'm seeing down here are how my own answers compare to, uh, or rather, the, the, the answers that have changed the most during this week. So I can see that a driver for this score this week, I feel good about the people I work with, has been down. I respect most of the people I'm working with today has been up. When I look over, say, for example, at the boss, I see that both scores have actually decreased over the course of the week. And what I'm able to do below, even though the answers are anonymous, these employee numbers are not their actual I I IDs, but rather just kind of a breakdown of this data. I'm able to say, okay, well, for instance, this person was feeling that they respected their leadership um, and respected um, you know, the, their boss or felt respected by the boss, but this person, while respecting the leadership, didn't necessarily respect um, the boss itself. So I can actually request a private conversation with that individual. They get an email that says, hey, I don't know who you are, but I know that you're feeling a little less um, you know, positive than some others. Can you tell me what's going on? And that facilitates a dialogue where um, the manager is able to gain more insights than might be able to be replaced by, um, that, that the, the employee may not feel as comfortable sharing face to face. Now, it's very important that this technology is not designed to replace management, nor is it a manager fixing tool. It's a manager insights tool. Uh, we believe that by providing managers with the information that they need to know during the time in which they need to know that, they're then able to take action, organize face-to-face -face meetings, socialize this information back. Now, if you're a manager or you're an employee, um, I'll, I'll say that you're probably thinking, geez, as a manager, I need another tool like I need a hole in my head. Uh, and employees are going, another task that I have to finish by the end of the day? Like, really? Are you kidding me? So, you know, what we find is, is that, and this is, this is true amongst all of our customers, that within uh, often a week, but at least within three weeks, that when a manager takes this information and socializes this back in a team huddle or a team meeting and says, look, I know that, you know, well, when I asked you last week how things were, you know, whether we were going to meet that deadline, uh, you know, there was some ambivalence. I, I, we didn't really stop on that. But looking at the Happily score, I see that everybody's really quite unsure about this, and I want to spend some time talking about that. Uh, I've just set myself a, a reminder that I'm at eight minutes. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about kind of where we are as a company. Um, we launched this, as I mentioned, uh, early last spring, uh, and we're now actually uh, with some of the world's largest companies. Uh, we've moved from paying trial, kind of less than 100 people, uh, into trials now where we've, ex we've, we've proven how the system works and delivers real ROI, real impact to their performance. And we've now expanded up into some of the, most wor the world's most respected companies. And um, we are, self we are um, bootstrapping at present time, uh, funded through the revenue that, we, uh, that we've earned through our customers. Uh, and we charge companies a fee of between uh, one to five dollars per month per employee for using this. So what we're really doing as a business is we're going after the large annual survey companies, the companies that currently their big asset is, is that they've got armies of consultants that will come in and deliver these insights if you give them lots of money and lots of time to deliver those insights. What we've said is, look, we can deliver those same One minute. insights. Yep, we can deliver those same insights, but through an automated tool that gives you that information uh, more frequently, uh, the insights more quickly, and in a more joyful and pleasant experience for everybody inside the company. So happily.com, that's happily with two eyes if you'd like to look at it. Um, we are currently focused on uh, companies of significant size of uh, 5,000 employees and up. So if you happen to be a company in that size, uh, you know, we'd love to talk to you and otherwise uh, tell your friends who work at those companies uh, to check out Happily. Thanks very much for your time.
how many how many how many paying customers do you have right now? Uh, we're not going to disclose certain information to a public audience in terms of our paying customers, but I can say that we uh, have not lost any customers and that we've been growing uh, at a very significant quarterly uh, uh, growth rate per, uh, for the last three quarters. And when did you start charging them? Uh, we start, that's a very good question. Um, we start, our first paying customer started in October of last year. Thanks, great presentation. Um, why did you do this? You know what, if you had, <laughs> if you had told me two years ago that uh, I would have a passion for employee engagement, I tell you your crystal ball would have been broken. Um, you know, we started, uh, I was approached, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I was approached by a local angel who had watched my career over a number of years and said, I will give you a certain amount of seed capital to start whatever you want. And I really had no idea what I wanted to do. In fact, I, I only knew, having run startups before, that I didn't want to do another startup. Um, but he said, look, take your time and figure out um, what it is that you're really passionate about. And um, we were actually pursuing a different problem um, and this started as a tiny little feature inside of a much different software application. But when we discussed this feature, we all thought, geez, this is something that we as employees of, previously as employees of large companies, this is something that we need. And you know, when I looked at the market, there was nothing else that did exactly that. And inside of the enterprise, there's typically enterprise software is big, bloated, long-term contracts, nobody likes it. So we wanted to build something that was super lightweight, that kind of had kind of aspects of a consumer application, but that delivered real business value. And I can say that I've really found now my passion in building applications like this inside the enterprise. Great. Um, just two more quick questions. What's the market size? Well, the market size is any company of over, um, for now, over 5,000 employees anywhere in the world. Um, and we've got customers in the Netherlands, uh, in Dubai. In, in fact, most of our customers are currently not North American. Um, uh, and I don't know why that is, but um, uh, I would say that the market size you know, is really any company that uh, is currently doing a survey or wants to have insights into their company. I, I'm looking more for a dollar amount. Like, have you, when you, you know, look to the marketplace? Sized, we have incised the market. We know that it's big enough for us to pursue. And so what is your uh, plans on sort of growing the sales and, uh, and, and really getting this out into the marketplace? Right, so typically what a startup does is it, and I've done this, I'm very, very guilty of this in the past, is you know, kind of proselytizing this big vision of how it's gonna you know, change the world and da 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 da. Uh, we are actually staying completely under wraps until we've actually got case studies with the CEOs and leadership teams of the companies that are currently our customers, and we wanna kind of you know, have a big aha moment with, instead of it being, this is what's possible, here are the savings, here's the reduction in retention, here's the improving, imp you know, improval in performance. It's those kinds of case studies that we want to kind of, you know, go onto the world with. Until now, our sales funnel is totally full, and it's with zero dollars in customer acquisition, zero dollars in marketing. And that shows that the need for a product like this, we believe that that shows that there's a significant need for a product like this. Um, so kind of staying under wraps, um, you know, there's also um, part of the reason why we've applied for this award is, you know, we, we don't even have a, a defined user agreement. So customers have kind of taken us on trust that we're taking this data and we luckily, even these large companies haven't even asked us for that. So that, that probably uh, needs to be fixed. Um, so we're, we're, we've got some kind of, um, we've grown faster um, than kind of the company's structure should be able to handle. So we need to kind of fix those things before we, we show the world. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm here to tell you all about Pixton Comics. So people around the world every day they express themselves and they communicate using images and using text, as I'm sure all of you do. But the problem is there's no easy way to merge these two powerful media into essentially graphical narratives or comics. And comics are an awesome medium for communication, for conveying an idea, for explaining something, for telling a story. So Pixton gives anyone the ability to create comics in a fun and engaging way. And Pixton is already built. It's not just a concept. And this is Pixton. Basically, just by clicking and dragging in your web browser, 
You can design an infinite variety of characters. You can move them into any position, give them expression, thanks to our patented technology. And you control all the elements of your comic in this way. So the individual panels, the characters, speech bubbles and text, props, backgrounds, uh, uploaded images, even sound. So it's really easy, it's fast, it's intuitive, and it's very sophisticated. So Pixton began as a, a pet project. I, um, I worked in Vancouver for about eight years as a freelance web developer. I worked with leading branding and ad agencies building interactive content for brands like Honda, Kokanee, Polycom, and Harley Davidson. And a number of uh, ideas and influences came together uh, basically in this, this idea of a new kind of comic that anyone could, could create, you know, that wouldn't require any drawing skills. It was very collaborative. So from, from humble beginnings, Pixon has developed and evolved. So I'm, I'm its creator. I'm responsible, currently responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Um, my key advisor is Howard Donaldson. Howard is president of DigiBC. He has 25 years corporate uh, executive experience in entertainment and education companies. He was VP studio operations at Disney Interactive, and he was uh, CFO of Electronic Arts Canada. Jeff Archer has recently come on board. Jeff uh, is formerly uh, was at Yahoo. He's now the director of the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies at Royal Roads University in Victoria. Uh, Jeff is currently exploring the future potential for product placement in Pixton. Also recently, uh, Randy Adams uh, agreed to be a, an advisor to Pixton. Randy is a co-founder of Funny or Die, and he was Steve Jobs' chief software architect at Next Computers. And I also have to thank a number of professionals, you know, our IP lawyer in Montreal, or sorry, patent lawyer in Montreal, our IP lawyer in, uh, in Vancouver, etc. So like I said, Pixon exists. If you go to Pixon.com, you will encounter a thriving, creative community of people from around the world making comics with Pixton and sharing them. You can comment on comics, rate them in various ways. You can earn badges through both uh, creative achievement and participation in the community. You can share your comics in innumerable ways by email or you know, embedding it on your blog, downloading it as an image or PDF. Um, and we have three products for the education, consumer, and business markets. So each one has a slightly different business model. There's a free version or of uh, some kind and a paid version for each. In the consumer space, people use Pixon for fun, to tell jokes, to riff on pop culture. Uh, you know, adults will use, use Pixon to, to sort of illustrate their political opinions, for example. In education, it's an invaluable tool for students. It's cross-curricular in any subject area. Students can use Pixon as essentially to create visual essays. So instead of writing a, you know, another essay, they can explain a science concept or summarize a book chapter in comic form. And, and the, the act of distilling something into its essence and putting it in a logical sequence and putting images and words together, it involves a lot of different thought processes. So it's a really, in addition to being fun, it's a really, you know, rigorously uh, pedagogical exercise. And then businesses are using Pixton um, to create, for example, internal training materials. So you can make any message more interesting and engaging by putting it in the form of a comic. And from the consumer point of view, Pixton represents the social gamification of comics. Because it has game-like mechanics and is socially enabled. So people create a, a vast array of, of comics, anything from sort of a traditional comic strip to a more ambitious works. Um, people even make their own original characters out of Pixton's props. So it, it's, it's amazing not only to see how the evolution of a particular individual, you know, from the time that they, they joined the site, just the, the, the diversity is, is astounds me every day. Um, our growth has been great. You know, number of active users and revenue is growing steadily. It's awesome. Cash flow positive. However, to take it to the next level, obviously we need to expand the company, and that requires capital. Um, Pixon has a potential to intersect with a lot of different vertical markets. Think about any, you know, the, the, in the entertainment industry, think about any character-based property. Entertainment companies are looking to find new ways to monetize their properties online, and they're looking to give audiences 
what they want, which is a way to not just interact with their content, but to create with their content. So we can take Pixton's patented technology and apply it to any characters and, and enable experiences that, that have never be before been possible. In the education market, uh, to take an example, we're about to partner with one of the world's most recognizable cartoon brands that has a very strong presence and interest in the education market, and they're effectively going to do the sales and marketing. So, you know, I don't want to worry about that, especially in the education market, which is a tough nut to crack, uh, but that's, that's the ideal kind of partnership that we need. So, going forward, I would like to focus on the consumer market because I think that Pixton has the potential to, to have mass market consumer appeal. I've summarized the strategy in three points. First, we need more branded content, characters, for example, that people know and love. And themed content, so for example, comic templates around certain subjects so that people can um, you know, have a starting point uh, and, and we can provide a more concise user experience. Uh, Pixton has, you know, has already started be, to be integrated into different platforms. In the education space, for example, there, there's a startup in Silicon Valley called Edmodo. It's VC-backed, and it's essentially Facebook for education, and they launched a paid app store two months ago, and the Pixton app has consistently been the number one selling app. So it's distribution channels and platforms like this that will enable us to further grow our user base, and mobile is a, is a top priority. And then beyond that, comics as a universally familiar medium, you know, an inherently kind of cross, it crosses linguistic boundaries, uh, the opportunity for international expansion is also significant once we've proved our strategy at home in Canada and the US. So I want to kind of end with this little tidbit. This is just an example. This is a demo I've put together. Um, I'm not implying any, at this point, any collaboration with Nickelodeon, but this shows how a very popular character can be um, you know, activated through Pixens technology and we can allow their audience to create stuff that's, you know, give them a creative experience that hasn't been possible before. So to sum it up, Pixen is a comic making tool and community, but Pixen also represents, uh, you know, an opportunity to, to redefine comics for the 21st century and to define a new platform for the creation of graphical narratives. You know, I've always strived to make the product as awesome as possible, but it's also never good enough, and I will continue to strive to make it more awesome every day. Uh, it kicks ass, it kicks the competition's ass. So now is the time to accelerate our growth. Um, as Scott mentioned, we're moving to Victoria. We're going to hopefully move into the accelerator space start hiring people, raise some money, and uh, take this to the next level. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Great, Clive. Thank you very much. Um, quick question for you. Can you quantify the size of the market that you're going after? Yeah, so as it says, it's empowering the world. So I know it's, you know, Maybe it's a faux pas, but there, in Canada and the U.S., there are 100 million t t uh, 10 to 29-year-olds, and they constitute 75% of our current user base in the consumer market. Um, I look at uh, websites like Stardall. You know, the, the certain, a certain percentage of our user base uses Pixton in a similar fashion. Stardall has over 100 million users. Um, I, look, I look at Glogster, you know, interactive posters. Again, a similar idea many millions of users. So I think that the, you know, the, the addressable market is vast and that's really all I need to know and it's a matter of how do we build that now from the bottom up because as long as the ceiling is uh, sufficiently large, you know, I think that's, that's sort of the, the important fact. What would be the closest competitor to what you're doing? The closest competitor is a, another Canadian company called Bitstrips. Um, they've, their traction is mostly in Ontario so far. Uh, we're established as the, the innovator, the leader. You know, we've won, uh, we were official honoree in the Webby Awards, um, won innumerable awards. We have patented technology with the articulated characters, which incidentally they, they copied uh, in 2010. So they'll, uh, they'll be hearing from us. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's real. They're really the only company. There there are other comic makers on the web that are, I have to say, just vastly inferior products. Um, I think Pixen has competitive advantages in that you know I've designed it from the beginning with this idea in mind that we we need to be able to apply this technology to any characters, any graphics. Uh, it's just it's fully scalable, and um, I think that my vision is probably more far-reaching. So what are the people that you hope to, to use this product doing now? So if, they, if there isn't a, a competitor that you're trying to knock off, how are they doing whatever it is you want them to do? Sure. So it's, it's not a matter of, you know, there are people out there who are making comics and they're frustrated, which presents a challenge. You know, we're, we're building a new market. Um, but there are people doing things that are similar in nature and, that, and they could be doing Pixit instead. And, and, and they range, for example, and this might seem out of left field, but think of action figures or dolls. You know, when I was a kid, um, I'd play with action figures, kind of move them around and tell stories with them, maybe with my friends. I find that, again, a certain percentage of the kids on our website are effectively doing that sort of thing, but now in a virtual, you know, social environment on the web. Um, look at any any tool for the creation of visual content, so animation, uh, which is more complicated to create. Um, something like Glogster, where they're creating like a single poster. Um, I think we're looking to attract people. Or, or another way of thinking about it is, you know, the, the post club penguin crowd. It's a creative group of kids. Um, they have active imaginations. They like telling stories and playing games. And this is really kind of they they create the character of the Pixton community. Two quick questions. One, what can somebody do after they've created a comic? How, how do they interact with it? Do they, you said you email it, but then do they save it? Are you, are you storing for them, or is it on an individual computer? What's, what's that scale strategy behind that? And the second question is going to be, can you just uh, elucidate a little bit on the pricing strategy that you have? Sure. sure. So it's currently hosted on Amazon's web services platform. So it, in terms of the infrastructure, it's fully scalable. It's load balanced, auto scaling. <laughs> Um, so your comics are stored in our database, but when you create a comic, you can, you can download it as an image file or a PDF. You know, you can post it on your blog. So we have like a, a widget, like on YouTube, where you, you, know, you paste them in bed code. Um, so, the, you know, we, we, we give people as many ways to share it as we can think of. Um, in terms of the monetization, we're currently monetizing based on subscriptions. So. With the consumer product, for example, there's a free version, and then there's a paid version, which is $5 a month. Uh, for the education version, there's a free trial, and then you pay per student per year. Um, we haven't run ads on the website to this point, but I think as, the, as we grow the traffic and we grow the, the, the reading audience, then there's opportunities for non-traditional you know, advertising like um, product placement. Got it. So on the go-to-market go to uh, strategy, I see you got the, the freemium to premium, and then you got the trial to paid. Uh, but you know, who are the partners like that you could leverage to, to really blow this up? Yeah, so there are a lot of companies out there that have access to vast audiences. So entertainment companies, for example. And I've met with you know, enter globally uh, um, known entertainment companies who are very much interested in, in collaborating. It's just a matter of having the bandwidth to execute it properly. Um, in every market, there, there are companies that have access to customer bases, and I think it's just a matter of finding the most strategic ones and uh, creating a mutually beneficial arrangement. Wow. Um, thank you guys all very much for coming on out here. Um, before I get started, though, I do want to thank uh, Entertainment Media and Social Media Camp uh, for making this possible. Uh, I also like to thank the judges for kind of giving their time here today uh, to provide feedback, as well as all of you. I mean, exactly like Scott just said there, this is a chance for us uh, to let you know what we're thinking. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's social media. We want to hear your thoughts back. Uh, we want to see you jump up on the website and click that feedback tab and tell us something. So, uh, like Scott said, uh, my name is Will Fraser, and I am the director of marketing for UPIC. Uh, UPIC is a local company. Uh, that works internationally, uh, and we build promotion tools that help you reward your current fans and customers for sharing. And this sounds like a simple concept, but 
you know, we really look at social media and we say, why do I post photos? Why do I try and create engaging content? And in many ways, the hope is that our fans, our followers, will like that, will comment on it, and that their friends will see it. And so we just want to build promotions that are designed to actually encourage this sharing behavior. There's lots of great tools out there about building our communities, and that's a very important step. But we really think that it's that next step of once we have those community members, once we, you know, we find there's five to 20% of any community that's looking to go out there and advocate for you. So let's give them a little sense of love for doing it and let's give them a reason uh, to feel like they're helping their friends. I mean, you know, the only difference between an ad and information is the person, the time and the place. So the people who know that best are people's friends. So, you know, you might see the shirts around here. Uh, if you don't have one yet, please stop by the booth. We'd be more than happy to hook you up with a shirt or two. One for the husband, the boss, the wife, whatever makes sense. Um, but this is really what we go on. I mean, if you're looking at what are you going to go to for the movies tonight, I mean, yeah, you'll Google it. But if you have a chance to ask a friend, that opinion means so much more, right? Now, if you've got a friend who's you know, crazy about a movie and they, they want to share that trailer with you, that also has a huge impact. And when a friend does share what they want, we know it's the most impactful form of marketing that we can have. You know, it's like reviews are very trusted, are very important, but really there is nothing more powerful than the recommendation of a friend. So why do we reward that? Well, the big thing about rewarding it is that if we can encourage that behavior, if we can help influence that sharing, not only do we get to associate the trust of that existing friendship with the referral, we can actually give that person a sense of VIP exclusivity and reward them. So they might, want to, they might be sharing a piece of video content, but for doing that effectively, they may receive a VIP pass for our event. They may receive a discount, which might actually bring them back into the store. But I mean, one person put it to me, they said, well, this sounds like a loyalty program where they don't have to sign up. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find those advocates that are helping our businesses and actually get them to you know, help our business. So what I want to do is really quickly, to make this clear, I'm just going to show you a promotion that we're actually running here right now at Social Media Camp. If you want to play along, uh, please just go to uh, facebook.com slash Y-U-P-I-Q, and you can actually participate in this promo. Uh, and Dan Gunn's actually seen this at the Social Showcase just yesterday. But uh, this is a new promotion we're kind of showing off here for you guys to give us your feedback on. It's a really simple idea. We've got a video of how one of our other promotions works, right? And we want people uh, to get out there, watch it, and if you like it, tell your friends about it. But every time one of your friends actually watches this video, you're going to get entered into a draw to win a flight for two with Harbor Air uh, to Vancouver. And yes, that is a real prize. So we've created this promotion, and we advertise it. We advertise it you know, on our Facebook page. So that's an automatic template we generate that gets posted. We advertise it on Twitter. We actually have a full interactive widget that sits on your website. So people can share and play right from your site, and they never have to leave. And you advertise it on your newsletter. So now when your advocates who self-identify see this, they simply click on the link, and they're drawn up to a custom tab. So this tab is fully branded, can be completely white labeled, and can look exactly like your company website. But you can see right now I'm being told win airfare for two to Vancouver, and I'm being shown the video. Uh, I'm not going to show you the video right now, but we'll watch it later on the website or, or through this promotion. Now, I want to win this prize, though, so I can think, hey, I want to share this on Facebook. And I simply click share on Facebook, and I'm going to select some friends. Now, I can select personal friends like I'm doing right now, or I can select uh, to post it on my wall, or I can select to tweet it, or actually, one of my favorites, we still see about 25% of our traffic through this, is I can actually email it. So this is great, because if you've got customers that aren't on social media, they can still play. They can get this in their newsletter, and then from that newsletter, they can actually still play and share it with friends. Now, as soon as that's sent out, my friend here is gonna get a notification saying, that I've sent them a message. So they see that notification, give it a click, and right inside Facebook, I know it's hard to see because of the resolution here, but I'm actually still in Facebook. 
they get this message from me. Now, in this case, my name is Stephanie, which is a little hard to believe, but we'll go with it. Um, so Stephanie has invited me to watch this video. Awesome. Now, when I get down here, we work on that friend relationship again, because not only am I trusting a friend to refer this to me, they've actually let me know that I'm helping them to watch. So if I press give, I've now given them an entry, and the video can start to play. At the same point, as soon as I've done this, I can now read about why they sent this to me, and I can start a viral loop, and I can start to enter the sweepstakes. So this is just one example of how this works. So it doesn't have to be a sweepstakes, it can be rewarding. Uh, and that's actually an example we have here. I'll just bring back up this. So we worked with uh, the artist Jan Arden in launching her new book, Falling Backwards. And what we did there was something very similar, but it was about her book. We said the first 10 people who get 10 friends to read the first chapter of her book receive an autographed copy of it. And it went like wildfire. We received, okay, that was a bad use of the word wildfire. Um, it, it went great. It, uh, it got about 24 times the average engagement for her Facebook page. We saw a few thousand reads of the book out of it for a, two, or for a 22,000 person community out of the first chapter. And uh, I don't wanna take credit for it, but the book did hit number one on the charts uh, that week, which is a great, uh, great moment. We also work with the not-for-profit industry, helping raise money for great causes uh, because we know the number one reason that people donate is because a friend asks. Uh, work with festivals. I put up VicFest here. It's one of our local champions. Uh, absolutely love the guys. They're willing to try any new ideas we have. Um, but, you know, VicFest has been helping draw their sponsors in to these prizes because what was a better thing for your sponsors than to get more than day of coverage? Um, we work with a lot of agencies. The Tartan Group's kind of the, uh, the first group in town that, that jumped in with us, but we love working with the agencies because um, you can completely white label this and lots of customers just would love a turnkey solution. But also you can see, you know, continuing to work with sports, entertainment, um, festivals, and, and, and just local businesses too. So where are we kind of going? You guys have seen us here today or for the last couple days. Uh, we're obviously trying to get you guys to know about us. Uh, like I said, you can go to facebook.com slash upick or upick.com to start playing in some of the promotions we're running right now. Uh, and if you see any QR codes like this around here, you can give them a scan. Uh, you win some prizes there too. But really, where we're looking right now is we're partnering up, we're looking for technology partners to push this forward to make it more integrated into your e-commerce solution or into your donation solution. Uh, we're looking for more agency partners. We're always looking for groups that want to try these tools out and then help us take them to their, uh, to their market. Uh, and the last thing is industry champions. You know, we, we love working with the guys who are out there looking to innovate and, and to be on the cutting edge uh, and just work together, you know. Sometimes they need something a little different and we love to rise to that challenge uh, and show them how we can really reward sharing on social media for benefits to their, to their bottom line. Thank you guys very much for your time and thank you guys very much for judging. Um, look forward to the decision. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record again, but uh, what's the market size? What's the dollar? How do you quantify what you're doing and, and what is that, that dollar figure target that makes this an investment? Yeah, so the market size is, is an interesting one. And you know, because we're still playing in the early stage space, it is amazingly hard to quantify. Um, what we're really looking at is that there are, there are hundreds of millions of dollars being spent at all the time to sponsor athletes, to drive brand awareness, to get that word out there. I mean, you're looking at Google AdWords, you're looking at, what, between four and five dollars for a hot word click. Um, and that's kind of the same space we, we look at a lot, is it's this, this is contextual based advertising in many ways, and getting that in front of your customer. So, of course, the markets that are kind of most desirable um, are kind of some of those, those bigger brands, those, those sexier markets, because we can get into arrangements with them that are revenue share based. Right, instead of, uh, today we offer a, a monthly service model, uh, but for some of the bigger guys, uh, the rev share is a little easier. Uh, they prefer that. Um, but it's really, it's still a, a broad market that includes kind of entertainment uh, and almost all forms of social marketing, so. So can you expand on the pricing strategy again? Then? You, you yeah. mentioned a couple here. I'd like to just delve a bit more into that. Sure, so today we offer monthly subscriptions. Uh, so it ranges from $50 a month to $450 a month. And really the variation with that is based upon how much uh, theming, white labeling you'd like to do, as well as how many promotions you'd like to run simultaneously. 
So uh, if you want to go to our top end packages, you have full white labeling and you have the ability to run five promotions simultaneously. Um, and you also be able to have the ability to give out 3,600 prizes on that. However, for a larger a company, you can understand that 3,600 prizes, um, if you're doing a national campaign, may not be sufficient. And so for those organizations, uh, ideally we like to work in a little more integrated manner and actually approach it as a revenue share model, uh, which helps reduce the risk for them, um, but helps also obviously increase the upside for us because uh, we know our tools can work and, uh, and we like it. <laughs> I'll be the broken record as well. Uh, how many uh, uh, paying customers do you have currently? So we probably have about 15 to 20 paying customers right now. Um, continuing to work on a, a large trial basis too. We offer one month free trials. So uh, right now we've just kind of started our big marketing push uh, and just starting to get the word out here as in why we're here. Uh, so we're seeing trial requests coming in uh, and they have about that one month period where they're the trial and we're obviously working to convert that and working to move, uh, move with our partners um, working with you know, several partners in the entertainment industry, uh, concerts specifically, uh, to try and help with uh, mass high-speed adoptions. So picking up a couple, you know, 10, 20, 100 customers at a time instead of doing one-offs. What's the uh, go-to-market strategy like? How are you going to really get this out on the market and, and blow this up? Yeah, and that comes back to the industry champions. Uh, really the big thing is getting a few national brands that we can really bring in as, as, as champions of it. So bringing in the athletes, uh, bringing in potentially uh, musicians, artists, those kind of things. Um, and really just trying to provide some high profile use cases that we can reference. Um, and then of course, then it goes to getting it out there on the blogosphere and getting it out there on social media. And in many ways, you know, we're, we're a perfectly situated company for that. Um, because if sharing's how we're going to do it, <laughs> you know, we got to eat our own dog food, right? So thank you very much. I'm sorry we have to cut it short, folks.